Welcome. We appreciate you joining with us to watch this message. We pray it will bless you, that we'll all learn, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in in watching the message at this time. There's an abbreviation used in long-term health care, uh, especially relevant in nursing homes. It's called FTT. It's a diagnosis of failure, failure to thrive. Basically, it, it encompasses four different symptoms. Weight loss of more than 5%, decreased appetite, poor nutrition, and physical inactivity. So anytime any of these four symptoms show up at the same time, it's a red flag to the staff of the nursing facility or, or the caregivers that something drastic is happening. Uh, could be a chronic problem, could be a disease that's taking place, but when the resident stops responding and starts displaying these things, it's something that they need to give attention to. The person often withdraws uh, even from family and so forth. So it's a very serious. FTT, failure to thrive. The question for us this morning is, do we have spiritual FTT? Is it possible that we are spiritually failing to thrive? Or let's look at our marriages. It's on marriage and relationships, uh, fruitful marriages, fruitful relationships. Do we possibly have FTT in our marriages and relationships. So good morning. As we continue with the series, uh, Valentine's series is basically what it is. This will keep going through Valentine's Day anyway, where we're examining the fruit of the Spirit, the teaching of the Apostle Paul from Galatians chapter 5. In that chapter, Paul names uh, several sins of the flesh. He said, avoid these things. And then he reverts to, well, this is what you need to be like. And he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. He writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. If you don't have this passage memorized, it would be great that you would do so. And then the second part of that is it would be great if we would all pray that about ourselves each day, that we might exhibit this fruit of the Spirit, that we might have this within us to have this in our relationships, in our marriages, that we might become more like Jesus. And what we need to recognize is it is possible to improve your marriage, have a lot better marriage, if we exhibit these fruit of the Spirit. Last week, we examined the fruit of love as the first one that we talked about. And this week, we move on to the spirit or the fruit of joy. So our title then is Christian joy or FTT. Do you and I actually have Christian joy or are we as Christians failing to thrive? Failing to thrive in our spiritual life, failing to thrive in our marriages, failing to thrive in our relationships of friends, family, and maybe co-workers. So think about the Christians that you know in, in all realms. Do they possibly, do you know of anybody that's possibly got FTT? whereas Christians are failing to thrive? Do you know of any marriages of people that are failing to thrive? Okay, so this is the last time I want you to think about the other person this morning. Because the rest of the service, the rest of the message is, this is to ourselves. This is about us. So ladies, if you hear something that applies to your husband, resist the nudge. Don't poke him in the ribs. And guys, don't sit there thinking, I hope my wife hears this. It's not about the other person. It's about you. It's about me. I'm preaching to myself this morning. Feel free to listen in. But try not to think about the other person or that other couple or that coworker. Try to think about yourself and how this applies to each of us. So let's fo each focus on producing the Holy Spirit's fruit of joy in our own lives and marriages. 
Let's each focus on producing the Holy Spirit's fruit of joy in our own lives and marriages. Focus on ourselves. You know, so many times we hear a sermon, we read the Bible, and we, we, we try to be like that, we try to improve like that, but we forget about Christian life is about relationships. How are we treating others? How are you treating your spouse? And so this is what this series is about. How are we treating one another in a space within the marriages? Now, if you're a Christian, you've already got some of this fruit. But as we know, you go into a supermarket, you want to pick the best fruit. And so what we as Christians want to do is produce the best fruit that would honor Jesus so that we would look more like Jesus. So let's look at this as this is fertilizer. This is cultivating the ground to improve the fruit that we're trying to produce. So let's first understand something about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is all interconnected. The fruit of the Spirit is all interconnected. Now, a problem that I'm having with this series is I think every week I get all this preliminary stuff done, and then I study the next thing, and then I think, we need to talk about this too. So the interconnection of the fruit, this is important. You know, I eat a lot of apples. I eat a lot of bananas. I love oranges. I, I love grapes. But you know what's better yet is when you have a fruit bowl. When you have the mix of everything that you can pick and choose and enjoy the, the variety. And this is what the fruit of the Spirit is. The fruit of the Spirit is like a bowl of fruit. Because Paul mentions so many different aspects of the fruit. Think of it another way, like a family. The family consists of a, a husband, a wife, a, a father, a mother. The children, son, daughter, siblings, brothers, sisters, grandparents, grandmother, grandfather, aunts, uncles, cousins. And in some cases, it includes a stepfather, stepmother, step siblings, and so forth. It includes the family. It includes the numbers. Uh, the Bible says that, uh, what, a quarter of three strings is stronger than one? Well, well, it is. We as a group are stronger than us as individuals. And so when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, each one there is also interconnected. We go to Paul's writing, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. He explains this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Now, right there's two of the fruit of the Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So think about this. Can you as an individual, if you lose your peace, if you lose peace, can you have joy? Can you have joy without peace? Can you have joy if you're frightened? Can you have joy if you don't have patience? I knew a guy a long time ago. He was always late, consistently. He could set the appointment up. He's still going to be late. I finally got smart enough to learn. I'll give you five minutes, maybe ten, and I'm leaving. And that's what I started doing. Because I could come to that meeting feeling so great. And when he was late, I lost my patience. I lost my joy. The day went sour because now I'm angry that I took the time to come and he's not showing up on time. He's stealing from me. And so you get the idea how the fruit is all intertwined with each other. The fruit of the Spirit with this interconnection, it's important that we know this. So think about how the fruit of the Spirit is intertwined in your marriage. How does your marriage go if you or your spouse don't have joy? If you lose patience, or the other one loses patience. If there's not that expression of kindness in your marriage. It's all interdependent. It's all intertwined with each other. Think about that fruit bowl, and you've got a bad apple and it's starting to rot. And you don't remove it. So what happens if it stays there? Eventually, the whole entire fruit bowl is going to go rotten. Because that decay has the ability to go from one fruit to the next when it starts touching it, and finally the whole thing is bad. And so that's the fruit of the Spirit. If you're weak on one, work on it, bring it up, but work on all of them at the same time so that none of them go sour. So what is this fruit of the Spirit? Well, let's look at it like this. 
Have you ever watched the show, The Price is Right? Now, I, 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 I want to... I don't want to be mean in this, but I'm just going to describe the show in my fun way of describing it. They're a bunch of kooks. You ever watch it? They're dressed up in all these costumes. You you watch the TV and they're bouncing up and down. They're jumping. They're having all kinds of excitement. They're they're having joy. And when their name gets called, they bounce down the aisle. They're all excited. They're screaming. They're hooting and hollering. And then they come down to the spot and they have to guess the price. And if they guess the price closest to it without going over, I think is the rules, then they go nuts again. They bounce up on the stage. They're acting like a bunch of idiots. And the only time they calm down is when they got to think about what the price is of this thing on the stage is. And if they get the right price, they go nuts again. Is that joy? Absolutely. How about, yeah, I hope that the most joyful day that you ever had was when you became a Christian. I hope the second most joyful day that you ever had is when you got married. But how long did that joy last? As it lasted until you found out about this stupid habit that your spouse has that you never knew about before and that might have been right in front of you all the time, but love is blind. And when you realize it's like, what are you doing? And, and you, you're trying to get used to each other so the joy doesn't last as much as like you'd have it to. In their book, The Fruit of the Spirit, unique title, authors Trask and Goodell, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, they write about the four common aspects of joy. Now, these are all earthly, materialistic joy. There's the joy of celebration, the joy of achievement, the joy of relationships, and then there's this unexpected joy. So let's look at them just a little bit. Celebration joy, that's the price is right joy. When you're jumping up and down, you're you're happy because you won something. Achievement joy is getting that job that you wanted, that dream job, you just had to have it. Relationship joy is marrying that guy or gal that you was after. Unexpected joy is when the lawyer shows up on your doorstep and says that your long-lost relative has died with nobody else to give anything to, so you just inherited $5 million. Unexpected joy. But in every one of these cases, those joys can dissipate in just a few seconds. For example, I did look this up on the Internet. If you're playing the game out in California, the price is right, you will lose at least half of your winnings to taxes. The state tax, the federal tax, and I don't know if you gotta pay tax to your hometown or whatever when you get back home. And of course, it could bump you up into the next tax bracket. You better hope that you didn't just win uh, trips and objects because you're gonna need the cash to pay for half of your winnings. There goes that joy down the drain. How about you got your dream job, but then you found out that it's got long hours, the work conditions aren't the best, your co-workers aren't the best, and so that joy is gone. You, you, don't, you don't have time with the family anymore. How about your dream marriage? Well, you know how that goes. It can go down the tubes pretty fast there also. And then that relative that you inherited all that money from, you forgot about the cousin that sues you because they think that half of it should be theirs, or maybe several cousins that sued you. See how fast, how quickly this joy, this materialistic joy leaves? The fruit of the Spirit's joy is much, much deeper than that kind of joy that we're talking about. The fruit of the Spirit joy has little to do with material things. The fruit of the Spirit joy has little to do with the outcome of your experiences. Although the experiences do affect the fruit of the joy, For example, Jesus is our ultimate example on how life experiences can affect your joy. How do you explain that Jesus, and we're going to read this, he had joy in his crucifixion. He had joy in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, Father, please take this cup from me. As he was sweating as though it was drops of blood. He had joy in his flogging, in falling as he carried the cross to Golgotha. 
as they nailed him on the cross, and as his father turned his back on him and died, Jesus had joy. How do we know? We go to Hebrews chapter 12, the last part of verse 2. The writer says, For the joy set before him, that is Jesus, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus had joy in his crucifixion. Now, it's not ha-ha joy, and it's certainly not the kind of joy that we think about, you and me, but it was a spiritual joy from his Father. His joy was in glorifying his Father, in doing his Father's will. Now, the question is, can we have that kind of joy? Absolutely. But many times we don't view it that way. Jesus fulfilling his Father's will brought fruit, the kind of fruit that the fruit of the Spirit, joy, brings. This brings us to a controversy of the fruit of the joy. The fruit of the Spirit, joy, includes pain. Fruit of the Spirit, joy, includes pain. Now, possibly... When you learned this morning that we were going to talk about joy, fruit of the Spirit type of joy, you might have wondered, yeah, well, Kenny doesn't know what I'm going through. And it's very possible that some of you did wonder that. Well, I know that. I've been through some of that pain. I understand it. That's why we use Jesus as this ultimate example of you can still have joy despite the atrocious, horrible amount of pain that you might go through. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying. The disciples are waiting. Jesus is praying. And Jesus prayed that he would glorify his Father in heaven. He experienced that joy. Even as he was asking his Father, please, 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 is there another way, God? Please do this. Another way. But he he got the answer, no, it isn't going to be. But still, Jesus glorified God, joy toward his Father in what he was going to accomplish. This is true of you and me also. Does the spirit of joy that you and I have, does it include pain and suffering? And the answer is yes. We go to the half-brother of Jesus, James, chapter 1, verse 2. James writes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Let's read that again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. We don't like this. I don't like it. I don't like trials. You know, I would love to go back to seminary or maybe get my doctorate in ministry except for the trials. In this case, papers you got to write and those exams you got to take. I love the lectures. I love the education, but I don't like the trials and the testing. But it's the trials and testing that prove you're worthy of the degree, or it's the trials and testings that make us into the kind of fruit, into the kind of person that Jesus is. It makes us become more like Jesus They mold us into Christ's followers despite the circumstances that we have to go through. Jesus' disciples even viewed the pain and suffering as a badge of honor for Christ. Early in Acts, of course, Jesus is ascended. He's back in heaven. So the day of Pentecost is over and done. The apostles are in Jerusalem, and they're preaching and teaching and healing people. And, of course, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, don't like it, so they arrest them. They take them before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin is the Jewish uh, court system. And so the disciples go, the apostles go before the, the court, and they don't really know what to do with them, but they decide to flog them and then release them. Let's go to Acts chapter 5, verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, they're joyful, because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, that name is Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you this. 
If someone came in here and flogged you this morning because of your faith in Jesus Christ, are you going to go away rejoicing? If they did it to me, I'd probably whine and cry. Floggings left permanent scars, blood, gashes deep into your skin on your backs. But yet they went away rejoicing because they were worthy of the beating. Are we worthy? Are we so much of a Christian that they would view us worthy of being flogged? Questions for us to answer. Do we experience joy when we go through a trial of any kind? Because of our weak nature, we need to go through these trials. See, think of it like this. You know, if you would just all pay attention to what I'm teaching you and read your Bible and learn from the Bible, we wouldn't need trials to go through. Now you can point it back at me and tell me the same thing. We go through trials because we don't seem to learn without them. If we just read the Bible and followed it, we wouldn't need the trials that God lets us go through or sends on us. But we don't learn well, so we go through the trials so that we learn. Think about this. An oak tree in the middle of the field. An oak tree in the middle of the field, a grand old oak, been there for 100 years, is one of the strongest trees around. It's gone through all kinds of storms, windstorms, tornadoes, blizzards, dry uh, droughts uh, through floods. Its trunk and maybe branches are twisted and gnarled. Matter of fact, if you want to cut lumber, you don't cut it from this tree that's in the middle of the field because it's, it's going to be tough and hard, hard to work with. You want to cut it from a tree that's in the middle of the woods that hasn't had this kind of adversity. It'll be easier to work with. The, the, the trunk will be straight, less knots, less branches to worry about. But... The tree in the field has gone through the adversity. In another case, the worker that has a hard physical labor job is in better physical shape than the one that sits at the desk. Now, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just talking about physical shape. If the worker that sits at the desk does not get exercise, then the worker that works this physical labor job is much more fit because the stress on the muscles the trials that they've gone through. And the same is true for us as Christians. We go through trials to toughen us and to grow us, to fertilize us, and to mold us into the kind of person that Jesus wants us to be. So how does this apply when we view the pain that we sometimes go through as Christians in our marriages? Okay, so this is Kenny Rader now, okay? This is Kenny speaking. I think that God allows us to go through trials in our marriages. I don't think he allows us to go through those trials to break our marriages apart, but to strengthen us. He sees a weakness in our marriage. And he allows us to go through a trial in that, in our marriage, to awaken us, wake us up, that then we will be closer as a couple. Closer to Jesus, closer to God. Use the Holy Spirit and closer to each other. Before Martha and I got married, I was a professional counselor. Well, not really, but I might as well have been. Because I could look at couples and say exactly what was wrong with their marriage. I could say, this is what they're doing wrong, and this is how you fix it. Of course, then I got married and found out how stupid I was. Because I was doing the same stupid things that they were doing, and I was blind and didn't see it. I was a jerk. But God let me go through trials. Now, Martha's been gone almost 20 years now, but I would hope that if I got married again, I'd be a better husband today than what I was 20 years ago. But I'm still going to be blind to some things. I'm still going to fail at some aspects. And God would let me go through some trials again, hopefully, in order to wake me up and help me to do things right. And this is the aspect that we all go through. Now, Satan does try to split the marriage. Satan will throw his darts at us, tempt us, try us, in order to get the marriage to split. God lets us go through trials to bring the marriage together and make it better. Better than it ever, ever was before. So what is this fruit of the spirit of joy all about, actually? 
especially if it includes pain. Well, the fruit of the Spirit of joy depends upon a relationship. Fruit of the Spirit joy comes from our relationship with God. The fruit of the Spirit joy, not the earthly, materialistic joy, but the fruit of the Spirit joy comes from our relationship with God. Not about earthly things, but about spiritual things. Paul states this more clearly in his letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Rejoice, where? In the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. We go to the church of Thessalonica when he wrote a, a letter to them. He says it simply, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Not the price is right, rejoice, but rejoice in the Lord despite the pain and suffering that we go through. So where does this joy come from? From God. From God our Father, Jesus, his Son, the Holy Spirit who lives within us, our comforter, this is where our joy comes from. Not the shallow joy of this life, the joy of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what do we rejoice over? Well, let's just use salvation, for example. I hope that you're joyful that you're here. Because if you weren't here, God may have just sent us all to hell where we all belong. Because we're all sinners. We've all fallen short. So we're joyful in the salvation. We're joyful in the forgiveness that came because Jesus Christ died for our sins, rose from the dead, so we now have a chance to live with him forever. He's done all that he can, but we still need to do our part. We still need to love and obey him. So it's still a two-way street, but it gives us forgiveness. So let's think about the empowerment of forgiveness. There's a lot of power in forgiveness. If you've offended someone, maybe intentionally or accidentally, and they're angry at you, and you go to them and seek forgiveness, how do you feel? If they forgive you, isn't that joy? Don't you feel the relief? Now, you may be still hurt because you're sorry that you did that to them, but it's a relief. It's, it's, it brings you joy. Let's reverse it. Someone has offended you. They come to you and seek forgiveness, and you give it to them. Doesn't that give you joy that they came to seek it? And, of course, you give them that joy, too? Okay, now let's get real. Maybe someone has offended you deeply, and they've done it more than once. And they enjoy doing it to you. Now, Jesus says we're to keep forgiving. But you and I know how difficult that is. That is difficult to forgive somebody of that. But you know what? You and I cannot have joy until we do forgive them. Think about that. It's impossible to have joy if you're angry at them because of what they did to you. Forgiveness isn't only about the other person. It's also about us. We cannot have the fruit of the Spirit of joy in us until we offer them forgiveness. Now, I'm not saying if you're in a marriage and this is a bad thing that keeps happening, I'm not saying stay there. If, 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 if your spouse is spiritually, mentally, or physically abusing you, you might need to get out of, this, out of that marriage. Now, we just need to be realistic here with this. But most of us don't have that problem. Most of us have a little irritation by our spouse or something, and we might need to keep forgiving them because they're just not getting it. Or maybe we're the ones who are just not getting it. Forgiveness is so powerful. So here's a question for each of us. Ask yourself this question. Do I have the fruit of the Spirit's joy in my marriage or relationship? And last week, we asked you to sit across the table from your spouse and ask about that spiritual love to have for each other. So this week, we're just wanting you to ask yourself, do I have the fruit of the Spirit's joy in my marriage or relationship? And here's the reality. If you don't, you probably have... FTT, failure to thrive in your marriage. And the other key is, if you've got failure to thrive in your marriage, you probably don't have 
the spiritual joy of the, of the Holy Spirit in relationship with God and in the other relationships. See, they're interconnected. If you want spiritual joy in one aspect in your, in your spiritual life, then you need that spiritual joy in your marriage, in your relationships. If you want it in your relationships, then you better make sure you've got it in this other aspect over here with God. You and your spouse can have the best marriage ever or whatever relationship with a friend or whatever that you've got, co-workers. If you just both engage this fruit of the Spirit joy, and it's our choice, it's your choice. Don't look at somebody else. How will you handle this? Father in heaven, this gets tough when we really come right down to it. That the joy that we want to have in our life, and I think every one of us wants to have that joy, but it comes so tough and difficult when these trials come at us or when our spouse or somebody else mistreats us. Or maybe we're just a grumpy person. Father, work in our lives. And yes, Father, many times we're blind to a fault of ours. Wake us up. Put us through a trial. I know that's scary, Father, but put us through the trial to get our attention so that we can correct it and have that relationship not only with you, which is the most vital one, but with each other in our marriages, in our friendships, with our co-workers and others. To even have joy in our enemies. Father, thank you for the example of Jesus. Help us to live up to the teaching of Paul and the example of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website at roscoffchurch.org. You can find the information there, how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you talk with you, and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.